Thanks to the wonderful franchise starring Johnny Depp, in our modern world, pirates are seen as something romantic and even good, which is funny, since in reality they're very questionable guys. Today we'll spend a day in a pirate's shoes and dive deep into the golden age of piracy. How did the strongest empires hire pirates? Why being a pirate was more prestigious than any civilian career? And where was the only pirate country? We'll tell you all that in the next couple of minutes. And welcome our first guest, Marcus Barbarossa Rashford. Like modern comedians, pirates used to insert their nicknames in the middle of their full names. Those names could mean anything. Some guys, like Bartolomeo Portuguese, just dropped the last name and used their home country or town as a nickname. Sometimes, fellow pirates gave others nicknames. Famous examples is a legendary Algerian pirate, Deadhead. His nickname has nothing to do with paranormal activities. The guy was so bald that colleagues made jokes about how not a single living hair could grow on that dead desert. When it comes to Marcus, his nickname Barbarossa was also given by friends for his bright red beard. As you can see, nicknames based on appearances were the most popular, long, fatty, and even strong tooth. Pirates across the seas had all sorts of nicknames. Lamer pirates didn't bother and just took fake names. You probably already know that pirates didn't have a strictly outlined era. They existed always, since ancient raiders on rafts to modern Somalian pirates with machine guns. Even the famous poem Odyssey written by Homer mentions pirates. 3,000 years ago, Phoenician pirates roamed the Mediterranean Sea. However, in the past, their main targets weren't ships, but rather coastal settlements. They captured inhabitants to later sell them as slaves. During later years, the line between pirates and merchants became blurry, since every merchant who owned a boat also had a team of warriors. And if he saw a sweet-looking ship, he just snatched it and sold the goods. And vice versa, if a pirate ship didn't run into any ships to raid, they became merchants and earned money that way. Even the legendary Julius Caesar was once captured by Sicilian pirates, who wanted to get a ransom. Ironically, right after the ransom was paid, Julius captured and executed those fools. Around those times, piracy became one of the most serious crimes. However, soon enough, many lands realized that hiring a pirate would allow them to do the dirty job while keeping their own hands relatively clean. And during wars, pirates became the go-to guys, since they knew the seas like the back of their hands. During this era, dozens of new words like filibusters, corsairs, capers, and privateers were born. All of those terms are from different countries and mean the same thing, a legal pirate. France, Holland, Britain, and others gave pirates orders to destroy certain ships during wars. In return, pirates received a paper that protected the fellows on this country's territory. Legal pirates casually stopped by civil ports, replenished provisions, and were very respected people. There are hundreds of pirates that switched to an official job and held high positions. A great example is Sir Francis Drake, a British pirate who raided Spanish ships. Once he sent a humble gift to Queen Elizabeth that amounted to twice the yearly income of the entire country. As a result, Francis was made a lord and an honored citizen of Britain. He was also protected from Spain in many legal ways. Our Marcus Rashford, also known as Barbarossa, was a lower flyer. The year is 1718, which is considered the golden age of piracy, and also the last one, since that year the majority of pirates were exterminated. But we'll get back to that. Now let's focus on people who surrounded Barbarossa. His ship is staying at a town, Nassau, which is till this day considered the capital of the Bahamas. Marcus isn't just chilling, he's there for a reason, since he's a member of the Brethren of the Coast. In 1706, a joint brotherhood of pirates basically invaded Bahamas and Nassau was the capital of the so-called Pirate Republic, which even had its own flag. Technically and legally, the islands still belonged to the British Empire. But in reality, the British administration fled, and pirates easily defended themselves from Spain and France using their fleets. In books and movies, there are many tales about pirate-run countries, but the Pirate Republic in Nassau was the largest of the really existing. Marcus owned a ship called Happy Delivery. Pirates really like naming their ships. Researcher Marcus Redeker analyzed those names in the 20th century and found out that 18% of them contained the word revenge, 15% used a roamer or a similar word, and 10% mentioned the royalty. You all probably remember the famous Queen Anne's Revenge that belonged to Blackbeard and that had an appearance in the aforementioned movies about Jack Sparrow. This name is a combo. It has both the word revenge and the queen. The reasoning behind such a name is to intimidate the future victims, and Happy Delivery isn't an exception. It could hold 10 times less people than the Queen Anne's Revenge, and had a 30-people crew, but the cherry on the cake was that smaller size allowed for faster raids. 
Barbarossa and his crew simply ran through their target ship and walked through the ship's holds. This is why the word delivery terrified sailors. Often opponents only had a couple of minutes to prepare, and hitting such a small ship with cannons was nearly impossible. Pirates of the Caribbean movies did a good job showing costumes and appearances of pirate crews. Fellows were often covered in tattoos, and those weren't always made to reflect their personalities. Back then, criminals were often branded. Spanish people used branding irons in the shape of the letter P with a crown on top. French branded criminals with a fleur-de-lis, the lily flower, and in England, they left an anchor with the current crest. It's safe to assume that at least 80% of Marcus's crew were outlaws, and therefore they covered themselves with tattoos to hide their criminal brandings. Pirates were also extremely superstitious. Amulets, lucky charms, patches. Any self-respecting corsair had something from the list. Pirates believe that a lead bullet dipped in silver or gold will protect you from a traitor's shot. A bear tooth guaranteed that you would come back home. Neptune's anchor helped navigate. And a small axe would almost secure a victory in an upcoming battle. But wait, there's more. If you were wounded and a chip of a knife or any other weapon was pulled out from your wound, you were supposed to keep it and carry it in your pocket for protection. Pirates also liked astrology and wore their zodiac signs on a chain. Perhaps the most exotic of all was the Blood Brother Amulet. Our Barbarossa had one. He had a friend named Anthony the Tall. The amulet was pretty simple. It consisted of a small container made out of a cactus. Inside was a drop of blood from a person you considered a brother. Pirates gave each other those amulets, then dipped them in wax and parted ways. And if Marcus was ever to receive an amulet from Anthony, he had to drop everything he was doing and venture off to help him out. Blood Brotherhood was a big deal to a pirate. One iconic thing Marcus's ship lacked was the Jolly Roger waving from the mast. If you spotted his ship, you would see a regular British flag. In the ship's holds, they also stored a French, Holland, and all other important countries' flags, along with the red flag with the skull, bones, and other parts. Officially, the black and white Jolly Roger was registered in the Oxford Dictionary in 1724, which is understandable given that sailing under such a flag would be equivalent to drawing a target on your own forehead. In the majority of cases, pirates sail under the flag of their country, since many of them were corsairs or had their own licenses, and that significantly lowered their chances of getting shot at from a cannon. When you want to rob a French ship, don't you think it's easier to approach it under a French flag so they don't have time to prepare? Only after coming close, pirates lifted one of their flags. Each of their flags served its own purpose. A logbook of Captain Richard Hawkins had a detailed explanation of them. He was captured in 1724. The captain claimed that if a pirate ship is approaching you under a black flag that resembles a Jolly Roger, that means they're willing to accept surrender. If pirates are approaching you under a red flag, there is no salvation and you should prepare for a battle. Even though a pirate's life was romanticized, they were smart people and knew that their chances of winning with a sudden attack were much higher. And Marcus often used a Spanish flag to approach Spanish ships and a French flag to attack the French. Another attribute of a pirate ship is a codex. It hung in a prominent place and had signatures of each crew member. One of the first people to utilize this practice was a famous pirate, Henry Morgan. A guy famous for his cruel raids later became a favorite of the British government and even became vice governor of Jamaica, all thanks to the codex, disobeying which was sometimes punishable by death. Every captain was allowed to make their own codex, and that's what the movies about Jack Sparrow got wrong. There was never a unified document for all pirates. If a captain wished to do so, he created his own and had the crew sign it. Codex were usually beneficial for everyone. For example, the personal codex of Francis Drake, even though it was unspoken, guaranteed that everyone all the way down to the cabin boys got a fair share after a battle, and often Captain Drake ended up falling short in order to pay everyone off. Now that we've talked about things that pirates did do, let's debunk some myths. And probably the most popular misconception is that pirates were drunks. Fellas like Barbarossa liked drinking, but the majority of ships were dry. A pirate's life isn't easy and takes focus. A drunk crew would become fish food during the first storm. Same goes for gambling. Pirates loved it, but they were allowed to do it only on land during stays in ports. A good crew on a ship works like a good clock and everyone knows their place. Patches over an eye are also real. But scientists concluded that they were used to prepare the eye for the darkness of the ship's holds. The eye under the patch adapted faster to the semi-darkness. We won't waste time on buried treasure. A pirate's life wasn't exactly long, and only a few got to grow old. So leaving something for the future was pointless. Let's instead talk about that one pirate republic on the Bahamas, where we left Marcus. In 1706, a bizarre situation occurred. Major wars between countries came to an end. 
and everyone finally understood that they would rather settle things around the table than at sea. Pirates stopped being valuable allies, and countries started hunting them down. A large group of pirates were concentrated on the Bahamas, forming a country of their own. Legendary Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard, was one of the island's regulars. Bahamas were also a new home for dozens of the most powerful corsairs, and they were all united with one thing, freedom. While raiding ships, our Barbarossa knew that he had a home to come back to to rest and strengthen up. Unfortunately, freedom was the doom of piracy. The Republic didn't even have a leader. On paper, it was Benjamin Hornigold, but in reality, the position meant nothing. Bahamas didn't have trials, laws, or anything else that could endanger a pirate's sense of freedom. And when in 1717 Britain remembered that they legally owned the islands, no one was there to fight for independence. And the Brits did something unprecedented. They sent to the Pirates' Republic an ex-corsair, Wood Rogers, who joined the British soldiers. He came bearing a generous gift, a true treasure, an amnesty document. All residents were offered to become subjects of the British Empire. In return, the Empire would forget their sins, and everyone would live in harmony as law-abiding citizens. But pirates don't follow the law, and many, including Blackbeard, rejected the offer. In the end, the majority of rebel pirates were simply killed, and survivors either gave up and become the Queen's servants or laid low. What did Marcus choose? We don't know, but you're welcome to leave your versions in the comments. The last thing we want to note is although there were some horrors, at least pirates were honest lads, unlike modern animals that are currently roaming the waters near Somalia. We're talking about old, hardcore pirates who had more sense than governments. Since, for example, a crew could easily tell their captain to go to hell and choose a new one. Can someone on a battleship do the same? Of course not. No matter how stupid and ridiculous the leader is, the crew has to obey. Pirates had more democracy than we do, but we shouldn't romanticize them so much. Remember, they are still murderers and thieves, but with a codex. To be fair, those were different times. A human life had no value, so for the medievals, pirates might have been the most democratic people on the planet. See you later, friends!